again. Um, and here we are with our next and our final speaker. Tonight's gone so quickly. Um, our final speaker for the night is Beck C of Plant Based Treaty. Beck is an animal and environment advocate who previously organized a chapter of the Animal Save Movement and coordinated events for a statewide circus campaign. She is politically active and has volunteered for a number of animal advocacy groups such as Animal Liberation Queensland and Bear Witness Australia. Beck will be speaking on behalf of the plant-based treaty detailing the urgent need to combat our climate crisis through transforming food systems. Thanks, Beck. Over to you. Thanks, Linda. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Yugger and Turrbal people whose land I'm on today. I pay my respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. Sovereignty has never been ceded. Uh, so it's nice to see some familiar faces here. And for those who don't know me, I'm Beck. I'm calling in from Mianjin, Brisbane. Um, I think Linda's covered a bit about my uh, history in activism, um, but I've been vegan for seven years and an animal advocate for most of that in various capacities. More recently, I've been focused on the intersections between uh, the exploitation of animals uh, and the destruction of our environment, particularly the current climate crisis. Uh, so today I'm here to speak to you in my capacity as a campaigner for the plant-based treaty. Uh, so now I imagine some of you have heard of the plant-based treaty and may even know a bit about it already, but just to get us on the same page, I'll cover a few of the basics. Um, so how did the plant-based treaty start? Well, it started in 2021. It was born out of the Global Save movement uh, as an initiative to put food systems at the heart of combating the climate crisis. It's modelled off the popular Fossil Non-Proliferation Treaty and designed as a proposed companion uh, to the Paris Agreement, which is notably quiet on the contribution of animal agriculture to the climate emergency. The goal is this, to transform our food system to one which actually enables us to live within our planetary boundaries and reforest the earth. That means a fully plant-based system. So what does the plant-based treaty ask? It has three demands and within these there are, there are 38 detailed proposals. You can find the full treaty on our website, but today I'll just go through the overarching demands. Relinquish, redirect, restore. So relinquish means not allowing the problem to worsen. No further land use change, no further deforestation for the expansion of animal agriculture. Redirect means addressing the driving force behind the problem, the reliance on animal foods. This involves an active transformation of our systems, promoting and supporting the shift to a plant-based food production at a structural level and an individual level. And finally, restore, an active healing of the damage that has been done, building resilience in our planet again and combating climate change through reforesting um, the earth and restoring ecosystems. So why do we need it? I'm sure you know a lot about why we need it. Um, I'm sure you've heard plenty of how climate uh, change impacts humans uh, and, and our natural planet. What I wanna focus on today is maybe something that's a little less spoken about, which is the impact to animals that aren't humans. So that I'm speaking about both native and farmed animals. Um, so that will be my focus tonight. Uh, all the threats that we face from climate change, animals face too. So heat stress, uh, increase in disease from an increase in temperatures, increased frequency of extreme weather events, food scarcity, water scarcity, and habitat loss. We all recall, no doubt, the 2019 bushfire season. In this bushfire season, it was estimated that 3 billion native animals were affected and 10 million farmed animals. It's hard to come to grips with a catastrophe of that scale. And in some ways I find talking about it in these terms sort of obscures the individuals. Um, so the next few slides, I'm gonna go through some quiet graphic photos. Um, so I, I would like to issue a content warning. Uh, they do include images of dead and severely injured animals uh, in some of the recent extreme weather events in Australia. Uh, so please do feel free to disengage for a moment. I will say when we're through those slides. All right, starting now. Uh, so these are photos that were taken in the bushfires in 2016 in South Australia. Uh, the floods in 2018-19, this is a photo from Queensland. 
The next few are bushfires of 2019, 2020, which is called the Black Summer Bushfires, uh, a record-breaking bushfire season uh, throughout East Australia. Uh, and this is from the floods uh, in 2022. I also have one more uh, graphic image or, or video rather that I'd like to show you a part of. Does that work? Is that video working for you? No, sorry, it's not. Not working? Oh, hold on. Right now. Mm, might have to give up on that one. Uh, look, it's a it's a video from Lismore. Uh, it's a, it's a video on a Guardian article from Lismore, uh, and um, there's about well, there's a huge amount of cows who are being carried away with floodwaters. It's uh, yeah, it's horrifying. Um, all right, we'll move on from that. So we're we're out of the graphic images now. Um, so. I'm sure people have heard the recent declarations from the Bureau of Meteorology who have just confirmed two weather events, um, El Nino and a positive Indian Ocean dipole. And that's as we approach our summer, uh, summer season, our bushfire season. Uh, so both of these weather patterns, they bring hotter, drier conditions. They amplify the risk and severity of our bushfire season. And it is particularly notable that this comes immediately after a protracted three-year La Nina event. Um, in fact, due to the heavier rainfall that we've had over of those years, there's been quite a proliferation of undergrowth, um, grass and bushland. If that dries out sufficiently from um, these current weather patterns, we will be really primed for a bad bushfire season. Um, regardless, we can we can expect um, some, some of those scenes we saw before from this summer. Um, so it's worth noting that climate change increases the frequency of these weather patterns uh, and also the severity of them. And then in turn, these weather patterns, they destroy forest land, they release huge amounts of emission into the atmosphere, uh, further driving climate change. All right, so moving away a little bit from some of that heavier discussion, uh, I want to bring it back to planetary boundaries, um, which I sort of mentioned at the start about living within our planetary boundaries. Um, I want to do this to contextualize climate change as part of this broader sustainability framework. Um, so the planetary boundaries framework defines nine key planetary processes and their safe and stable operating limits. Safe limits as in uh, a space in which we know our planet is safely habitable. Beyond this, we're at ever increasing risk of planetary instability and fundamental alterations to the planetary processes that support our life and that of other animals. Um, so just this month, a new assessment was published in Science Magazine. It found that we have now tra transgressed six of the nine planetary boundaries, and that's up from four in 2015. Um, now, animal agriculture pressures nearly all these boundaries, um, being a leading driver of land system change and deforestation, uh, of pressure on freshwater systems, of nutrient pollution as runoff from farms, otherwise known as eutrophication and labelled here as biogeochemical flows, uh, and also contributes greatly to climate change and biodiversity loss. Two areas I want to focus on today uh, is uh, greenhouse gases and deforestation uh, and their role in climate change. Um, so often when you hear about animal agriculture's contribution to climate change, um, you'll be given a figure of around 13, 14% of greenhouse gas emissions are attributable. That figure doesn't really tell the whole story, and that's for two reasons. And the first one is to do with methane. Animal agriculture is responsible for a third of methane emissions worldwide. And in Australia, that figure is about 50% of methane emissions. So why does methane matter? Well, we'll start off with a quote from IPCC lead reviewer, Zaoki Derwood, who likened climate change to a marathon. We need to stay in the race. Cutting carbon dioxide will not lead to cooling in the next 10 years. And beyond that, our capacity to tackle climate change will be so severely compromised that we will not be able to run on. Cutting methane gives us time. So let's unpack that a little. Greenhouse gases can be compared broadly speaking 
on two bases. The first is its warming potential, as in how much heat it retains in the atmosphere. The second is how long it persists in the atmosphere. So if it's from this diagram here, you can see uh, we're going from 2023 to 2043 to uh, 2123. Um, basically, that is us looking at the heating potential of methane uh, as compared to carbon dioxide over different time frames. Um, over a 20-year period, methane has 84 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide. But here's the good news. It's short-lived. In about 10 years, it largely degrades into carbon dioxide. That's not so good, but it does mean that you do reduce some of the warming potential in the atmosphere. And it makes it a powerful lever to slow warm warming in the short term. Now, none of this negates the desire, ne the dire <laughs> need rather to defossilize the energy sector. We do have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it's gonna take a long time to reduce that. Um, and we do need to stop further emissions now. But as Derwood implied, cutting carbon dioxide emissions serves a longer term goal, a necessary one. Um, but we're already estimated to be at around 1.3 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. So we need to slow warming in the short term as well. That's so we don't trigger planetary tipping points and risk runaway warming. An additional element of this is the paradoxical effect of um, reducing uh, coal-fired power plants. And that is that we also get a concurrent reduction of sulfur emissions. Um, now, sulfur emissions are not very good for health, but what one thing they do do is they reflect heat back from the Earth's atmosphere, and thereby they mask some of the warming that the levels of carbon in our atmosphere actually have the potential to do. Sulfur falls out of the atmosphere much faster than carbon dioxide degrades. So as we defossilize, if we don't take other measures, we could expect to see an increase in the rate of warming in the short term. As you can see there, methane is responsible for about 0.5 degrees of that 1.3 degree warming uh, with carbon dioxide the remainder. But then we do also have, um, we also have that negative effect from sulfur dioxide. So reducing methane emissions, once again, is a clear and obvious strategy to mitigate the impact of this. And as Derwood would say, keep us in the race. So that's the first reason that um, the 13, 14% figure doesn't really tell the whole story, but here's another, uh, that is deforestation. Um, when included, deforestation takes uh, the estimates of animal agriculture's contribution of greenhouse gas emissions up to about 20%, and more recent estimates are actually up around 24%. So setting aside the crucial role forests play in biodiversity as home to our native wildlife, forests also function as massive carbon sinks, and we can't afford to actually lose what remaining capacity we have to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. I'm sad to say that Australia is the only so-called developed nation on the list of global deforestation hotspots, and that's largely owing to continued land clearing in the eastern states for animal agriculture. The map on the left here tells a sad story of the decimation of Australian forests and what little remains. The figure on the right shows the Australian government estimates of the percentage of land cleared between 2016 and 2020 for animal agriculture, 79%. So the campaign. Um, the plant-based treaty campaign is designed as a bottom-up pressure campaign to encourage governments to negotiate a plant-based treaty. Uh, and also to encourage governments at all levels to do their part in developing and implementing a plant-based food system. Um, one way we're doing that is through seeking endorsements at different levels of government, but also among individuals, organizations, and businesses. So this is where we're at globally. Now, one big part of this is city campaigns, seeking city endorsement through contacting local councillors. There's scope for action at all levels. Overseas, we've seen councillors successfully bring forward motions to council for city level endorsement of the plant-based treaty, uh, resulting in 21 city endorsements across the UK, USA, and India. Um, now, Edinburgh is a notable example as the first European capital to endorse in January of this year after conducting a detailed impact statement of the treaty demands. They are now working on a city implementation action plan to enact the principles of the plant-based treaty and embed it in their city's climate action plan. Supporting structural change at both city level and more broadly, the plant-based treaty team have also been working on a series of playbooks, which are best practice guides offering model examples of what action can be taken at a structural level in universities, schools, hospitals, prisons, and more. 
Now, we've had our own Australian City campaign up and running for a few months now, um, both through the email action on the website and also through targeted emails to elected representatives. So far, uh, we've received endorsements from three current and two former MPs at the state level and nine local councillors across Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland. These are including representatives from the Animal Justice Party, the Greens and Independents. Um, sorry. Um, so these are a couple of the quotations that we've received in support. Um, this is from Georgie Purcell, uh, MLC for the Animal Justice Party in Victoria. If we are serious about fighting the interlinked climate, biodiversity and extinction crises, the plant-based treaty is essential. This is from jo uh, Dr. Josh Fergius, Councillor for Monash with the Victorian Greens. Discussion of our reliance on meat and animal products is often deemed off limits. This can't continue. We must urgently come to terms with its impacts, which are far reaching and many. Uh, this is a final quote um, that I'll add in today uh, from a councillor from Port Adelaide, um, Lazarus, uh, who is an independent. Um, they said, future generations are carrying the burden of inappropriate land use and animal cruelty. With businesses incentivized to life of profit and overpromise that farming animals is a sustainable practice. So on top of the city campaign, we've also been doing a bit of public outreach. Uh, as you heard before, um, Steve will be doing a stall with Alex, I think Sunday. Um, and uh, I have been also doing collaborative stalls with uh, Animal Liberation in Queensland. So that's a really great thing that we've got going on now um, to, uh, to get both messages out there um, and uh, help promote both causes. Um, this is from the Brisbane vegan markets. The previous picture was from the Sydney vegan markets. Uh, and then we've also been liaising with supportive business owners like Adam, owner of the Buddha Bowl Cafe, who have generously put up our posters on display. Uh, so how can you help? Firstly, uh, by signing the treaty. Uh, it'll look like this. Um, if you just go to plantbasedtreaty.org, uh, you, you should be able to actually plantbasedtreaty.org slash endorse and you'll be able to find this exact uh, picture. And the other thing we would love you to do is to participate in our online city campaign email action for Australia, uh, which you can find here. It'll look like this. Um, you just go to Act Now City Campaigns Australia. It'll open up a page like this. Um, as you can see in the picture on the right there, you just select your local government area uh, for the ACT. That that won't be local council level. Um, it'll it'll be the legislative assembly. But um, for every other area, you'll be able to select your local council. It'll bring up your councillors, um, and there's already a pre-filled letter uh, which you can just send to them, or you can adapt the letter to include any extra info you'd like to share with your local council. Other than that, um. We'd love to hear any questions. Uh, we'd love to hear if you'd like to get involved and please uh, follow the campaign on our socials. Thanks so much. Wow, thanks. Thanks, Beck. That was really illuminating. And um, it's great that you're offering up ways that people can actually help. Otherwise, I think people just feel so, oh, I'm good. This guy has fallen already. So. Um, that was great, and um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who would like to grab hold of those slides to send to all and sundry who are still got their heads in the sand about this whole thing. So thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. It's, it was great to hear you, and um, we'll check in with you again um, to see how it's going. Love to know. So oh, um, I might move on now to the chat box because we've it's the first time ever we've had more um, messages than attendees. So, <laughs> okay, so Harley uh, has just chatted. If anyone wants to get in touch, please feel free to reach out to me at harley at farmtransparencyproject.org. And if I balls that up, just write to me and I can send you anything. Thanks, Nadia, for the plant-based treaty link. Um, Lisa, uh, to, to Harley and um, FTP, makes me realise that Alex and I are heading to the eight-year mark fighting Blantyre Farms this December. Thank you so much, Bex. So important and such important work. Um. Uh, 
Claire Mann, um, congratulating um, Harley. Um, okay, this is a question. Ellie, Ellie's asked this question, and it's one I was wondering as well. Um, a question from Ellie. is how did Chris get aggressive as in other states? Their focus is mainly on biosecurity. And if a farm or slaughterhouse doesn't have a biosecurity management plan in place, then they can't prosecute. Wow. We're very, very lucky in this at the moment. It would have been a lot harder or impossible to do this campaign in New South Wales, for instance, as we would be facing much more serious ramifications. Well, Harley, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I, I hope we'll keep that a secret amongst our group. We don't want we don't want that changed. Um, Susan Sorensen, tears for the animals. Beg your pardon? Oh, no, nothing. I just said yes. We are very lucky here currently. Um, it's a lot <laughs> easier, but hopefully it doesn't change. Oh, yeah. Um, Susan is saying tears for the animals and tears for everyone who has put themselves on the line physically, emotionally and professionally. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, so Lisa and, um, okay. So, uh, Claire was asking, when is the Mount Isa Rodea, please? I'm in the area in December. And Lisa responded, Hi, Claire, so love you're here. It was in August and annually in August. Um, from Sharon Church, Harley, no words are enough. Thank you. Boodle, it has been an honour to have you here and listen to you. Thank you. And from Andrew, well done, Harley and Farm Transparency. Daria, Harley, you and your team are extraordinary. Thank you. Clement, Harley, thank you so much. Bless you. Um, and Laura's given you a round of um, applause. Voodle, I can't imagine what he went through for that amount of time, let alone the victims. I truly admire this gentleman, Chris Force. You all did an amazing job. And Harley, I think sometimes it's more scary to be outside waiting than in amongst it because you're worrying about your colleague. And um, so I can imagine that was really, really stressful. And Steve Morelli is saying, just incredible. So well done. Um, okay. Uh, all right. That's that's kind of it. So um, thank you. Thank you to everyone for participating like this. And Ruth Weston, thanks to all the pres presenters and to Animal Liberation for organising this. Thanks, Ruth. We we do love these get together with everybody. And Laura says thank you, everyone, for this meeting plantbasedtreaty.org if you'd like to get in touch or ask any questions. And Susan says, such an informative and inspirational meeting. Thank you to all. Heather Edwards, thank you so much, everyone. Hi, Heather. Okay, I think that's our next um, webinar will be on Thursday, the 16th of November. Um, so just, uh, just, um, uh, yeah, keep an eye on our social media. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. And we'll, there'll be more details coming through. And once again, thank you for attending tonight. It's been wonderful to share this time with all of you and to our speakers. Biggest, hugest thanks. To, um, it's been a great educational evening and um, Look forward to seeing as many of you. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thanks right. so much. Good night. Bye bye.